let's just um, get started. There were probably some more people coming. So sorry about the food. There was a misunderstanding between me and our secretary. She was out of town and I didn't order it. So it's my fault. Um, today we have David from Killings from the geography department. And he's going to talk about the future of drought in the southeastern U.S. And this work is actually a collaboration with his pals, Joanna and um, David Tate. Yeah, yeah I, I'm her husband. I have to collaborate with her. <laughs> 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 no. Is that advantage or disadvantage? Oh, it's great. No, we work, we work really well. Yeah, we published four or five things together, so it's, it's really nice. Um, I, uh, yeah, I, I apologize too for the not being any food, you know, if I told half the people in here, like, there's going to be food, but <laughs> so I'm grateful that you're still here, you haven't just left, there's no food. Um, I also, yeah, I really like using this background, um, this template, but you know, once I was, I was talking to a room full of geographers and climate people, and this lady, climatologist, was like, what the heck is this? Is this a, is this a tropical cyclone? Is this, a, is this high pressure? It's like, no, it's Australia. It's a C2. <laughs> <laughs> but usually what, what I do most of my work in, I'm a climatologist, and, and usually I'm working with extremes of something. Mostly what I do is heat waves, so it's extremes and temperatures. So this one usually works really well for me because it looks like, oh, it's so hot in, in North America. So usually that's why I like, I like using this one. Um, what I want to talk about today, um, is, is only one indicator of drought, I kind of cheated there with the title, we're really going to be looking at future projections of consecutive dry days, so long periods without any precipitation, which you can think of as an indicator of meteorological um, drought, but I, I will touch on some, some other things too. Um, so, if, you know, as a climatologist, if I think about the southeast, I, I tend to think, oh, there's plentiful water everywhere, it's, you know, it's, it rains a lot, and it was certainly if we think about it from a paleoclimate perspective, then the last century was pretty wet, uh, all things considered, uh, you know, if we go back long enough uh, to compare it to. But having said that, the last couple of decades have been really, really dry. We've had these really severe droughts in the southeast, um, you know, in the 80s, in the 90s, in the early 2000s, 2016. I, I, I'm particularly partial to this one because this is the year I started working at this university and I walked to the office um, every day and, and the fall of 2016, my first semester here, I was walking to the office every day and of course it was, it's hot, you know, August, September, October, I'm sweating, sweating, and like, there's never any clouds, there's never any rain, but you know, what the heck's going on? So there was this 60 day or more period where we didn't have any rainfall, those of you that were that were here in, in fall of 2016 may remember that, it was, it was really unusual, there was a lot, of, a lot of records broken for these consecutive dry periods. Um, and there was a lot of agricultural losses. There was a state of emergency declared in, in Florida in spring 2017, and we had wildfires. This is Gatlinburg. This is the Smokies on fire behind the behind a hotel there. So we had a, we had a, a bad situation in, in 2016. And if we look at the National Drought Monitor map, what, what we see is that the southeast was was in this extreme and actually exceptional drought. And if you kind of kind of look at that, and then you look at over here, I mean, maybe this is this is certainly not as long term as what we've been talking, you know, what we're seeing out in the southwest, but there's actually a bigger area in severe, exceptional, extreme drought over here than there is out in the southwest in 2016. But we're not really talking about, about this one. We're, you know, we're talking a lot about this, but not so much focused on, on the southeast. But this was a really, really bad situation in, in 2016. This is just after Thanksgiving. Um, if we look at some local stations throughout the southeast, um, this is number of years of record. We've got, I know it's very small, I'm sorry. Um, we've got precipitation through 2016. We've got the average of what should normally be. And then we've got the departure from average. So we're, we're down a foot of rainfall in a lot of these stations through 2016. And some of them only having half or, or less of what they should normally have had in 2016. So huge deficits of rainfall here. And if we also look at there was this USDA um, agricultural report, they found that 21% of, of cattle was in a was a poor or worse condition. 95% of pasture and rangeland was in a was in a, a poor or worse condition. So this is something that not only is standing out, in the, obviously from the climatology perspective, but it is having an impact uh, on agriculture. It's having an impact on on water.
our resources. What, what, what caused the 2016 drought? Uh, one thing is the Bermuda High. Some people maybe prefer to think of this as the, the lower part of the North Atlantic Oscillation. It's a big high pressure area, a big anticyclone, it normally sits out here in the Azores. Sometimes it comes closer in towards the southeastern United States. Sometimes it intensifies. And you get this anticyclonic flow and it brings drought conditions to the southeast. And also, arguably, as we went through the back end of 2016, we had a, a weak La Nina that appeared. When we have a La Nina, it alters the position of the jet stream. Wherever the jet stream is, tends to be where the rain is. So when we have a La Nina, the jet stream goes a little bit further north out of the southeast, and you tend to have drier and warmer conditions in here. So La Nina kind of amplified and intensified that drought that we had in the, in the second half of, of 2016. But, you know, drought, drought is a hot topic in the southeast. Uh, when I'm talking about heat waves, I always like to drop this line. I'm talking about heat waves, they're a hot topic. <laughs> Um, I think it applies to the southeast too. Um, you know, I think there's a, there's a lot of conflict. I mean, I'm kind of preaching to the choir probably in here, but there's there's a lot of different um, interests on water resources in the southeast. It's, it's important for drinking water. I mean, there's like five million people that need drinking water out the uh, Apalachicola, Chattahoochee, Flint, the ECF basin. Um, so there's a big demands, particularly from Atlanta. Um, there's there's demands on recreation in the reservoirs and the lakes and the rivers. Um, and then there's also demand from hydropower. Um, three of the top 10 hydro-producing states in the US are in the southeast. Um, Alabama, Tennessee, and North Carolina. Right? They are three of the top 10 hydropower producing states. So it is a big part of renewable energy production, is that we, we need water for hydropower. And um, this has led to a lot of legal um, disputes, water wars in the southeast. Um, our man Shelby has <laughs> even stepped in here. Right, so we're, 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 it's coming to the point where we're having these, these, these big fights over who, who, who gets the water, what, uh, you know, who can use it, and who, who has rights to, uh, to the water resources. So there's this, there's this need um, to downscale. Uh, you know, uh, we have to go from general circulation models, global models, we have to downscale. Um, because not just from, from a climate perspective, you know, to, to better represent reality, but also um, it's, it's really at the local scale that impacts, you know, going to impact society. So we really want to, we want to be looking more at the local scale. So this is not the southeast, um, for those of you non-geographers out there. Um, this is my neck of the woods. And, and this is an example of a, of a course resolution GCM. So I'm, fr I'm from up here in the west of Scotland, and I can tell you that it rains a hell of a lot in the west of Scotland. Um, and that's not necessarily depicted on here. But when we start to nest a, a regional climate model within the GCM, a regional climate model boundary conditions, we start to be able to pull out more of the local spatial variation in here. And so it starts to look a lot more like the actual observations, a lot more like reality. So yeah, I'm from, I'm from in there where it rains a hell of a lot. Hence, I, I moved to the southeast. I think it was a good move. So. Yeah, I'm from here. All of this, all of this heavy precipitation in the western, the western uh, part of Scotland, it, it just rains all the time. So, you know, I think it's it's important that we do this. We can do downscaling um, dynamically. We can we can put regional models within, nest them within the, the the general circulation models, or we can take a statistical route to downscaling. We can do things like bias correction or quantile quantile mapping or analogs, a bunch of different methods to statistically downscale. What we're going to be looking at here um, in just a second is uh, constructive analogs, which is a statistical downscaling technique. So imagine, if you will, we've got a course resolution map of the future. This is for 21st of January 2055. All right, so we've got this course uh, GCM model output for the future. If I'm, if I'm using an analog technique, what would I do? I would try to find course resolution history, historical days, analog days from observations that kind of look a lot like my future map does. And then, what would I do? I would, I would combine those historical analogs as a weighted sum. So I'm kind of putting these together, like, you know, like you might be doing like a regression. And I'm saying they equal this, this future map that I've got out of my GCM. And then, of course, because they're historical analogs, I have the fine scale map for them, too. So I can take my same weighted sum, I can combine those fine scale maps, 
And then I can produce a fine scale map of the future. Right? Let's see what I'm doing. I'm using these analog days to construct um, the fine scale resolution of, of, of the future. The issue um, with doing this is that typically this is done over a broad area and it's also typically done using multiple, sometimes 30 or so analog days. So what you end up doing is kind of watering down your extremes in here. You're combining a bunch of different days together so it's not very good at representing extremes. So what we've used is something called localized constructed analogs where we do this on a point by point basis so it's much more local as opposed to broad scale. And then we're also doing it using one single best match analog day so you're not watering down a bunch of different analog days, you're only using one at a time. So it's, it's probably better for extremes. So the, the objective that we had here was to take 32 um, LOCA downscaled, localized constructed analog downscaled models and see how well they simulate periods of consecutive dry days. Um, by dry day, I'm, I'm referring to days where we don't really have any measurable precipitation or less than three millimeters of rainfall and project those models out to actually two future time periods, a near future 2020 through 2060 and then a 2060 through 2099 using two different um, emissions directories, two different RCPs and what we're really looking at is estimates of 20 year return periods of consecutive dry days. So we're looking at fairly long periods of no rainfall. Um, so a 20 year return, obviously a 5% chance in any given year. This is the uh, observational data that we're working with. This is from Ben Libna's group out of UC Boulder. Um, it's, it's pretty data, it's, it's sort of model derived, taking like 30,000 um, co-op stations, uh, satellite data, a whole bunch of stuff, lumped it together, and it's, uh, he's come up with a, with a pretty good data set. It's 16th of a degree, it's daily from 1950 through 2013. I've used it a bunch um, in my heat wave work. I find it to be pretty good for temperature. I've used it a couple of times previously for precipitation. It's pretty good for that. It has max and min temperature. It also has daily uh, precip. And it covers, I like to call it a North American data set, but it covers the, the whole of the continental United States. It goes down through Mexico and it goes up into Canada a little bit. We're obviously focusing on just the southeast. This is our definition of the southeast. Um, Tennessee and North Carolina south and, and Mississippi eastward. Um, we've got on here NOAA climate division, so we're aggregating our analysis up to up to those um, climate divisions that have similar climate with them. These are the 32 models, and this is teeny, but these are not all of the CMIP5 models, but it is certainly a, a good bunch of them. I want to I want to just mention briefly how we're how we're evaluating these models, how we're assessing the skill of the models. Um, this is done using Sarah Perkins skill scores that she first proposed in a paper in 2007 and then kind of advanced a little bit in 2013. And essentially, it's looking for overlap between probability density functions. So if I've got a probability density function for my observations and I've got a probability density function for my model output, I'm seeing how closely they overlap. If they sit bang on top of each other, that's a skill score of one. If they don't overlap at all, that's a skill score of zero. So it's essentially a measure of overlap of those PDFs. How it works is you take the cumulative minimum along the x-axis. Right? So if they were totally not sitting on top of each other, then you would have zero all the way along the x-axis. You can also, I mean, you can do this for the entire PDF. You can also do what she calls a tail skill score. So you can do it for just a certain high percentile, like let's say the 90th percentile of the PDF. So you're really focusing in on how well is the overlap in extremes of the distribution. We have uh, divided our data set into two seasons. We've got a warm season that's April through October, and we've got a cold season that's November through March. We did that based on USDA estimates of agricultural growing dates. So we've got a, a warm period where we are growing stuff in the region and then we've got cold season where we're not growing anything. Uh, I, I've used these skill scores for a number of years and um, you know recently a few years back I got, I got thinking what is a good skill score, right? I mean does it have to be one? Does it have to be complete overlap? I don't think so. But is, is 0.95 okay? Is 0.9 okay? Is, is 
0.8, still okay. Um, so it's kind of subjective, the, the Perkins skill scores. So what I decided to do was come up with a basic significance test for the skill scores. So what I'm doing is essentially generating a bunch of random numbers from a uniform distribution, and I'm binning them into the observed CDF, the, the observed cumulative distribution function. So I'm creating a, a random distribution that's constrained to be the same as the observations. So I could do that a thousand times or whatever, and I end up with a thousand random uh, uh, distributions. I can then calculate the skill score in each one of those, and then I end up with a random distribution of skill scores. I can then see where the actual skill score falls in that random distribution, and then you can sort of get a p-value out of it. So we've got sort of got a significance test for the skill scores. So for example, this is for this is for temperature here, the, the tail of a temperature distribution. And what I've got here, the, the, the dots are observations, the X's are the downscaled model, and then the triangles are the simulation. So in this example, the simulation has a skill score of 0 0.95, the modeled, the downscaled model has a skill score of 0 0.8. So I would argue that 0 0.8 here is not doing a good enough job. It's way over up here, it's way under down here. So it actually would fail my significance test. So then that's the, that's the paper where I, I talk about the um, significance test. Um, we wanted to visualize our skill scores, you know, kind of quickly, nice, nice, nice visualization of them. We've got our, our um, climate divisions along the, the bottom here, and then we've got models up the, the, the right side there. And this is just a heat map. This is just showing um, uh, skill scores, in this case, for the warm season, and it's the entire PDF skill score. And I've got this nice little density plot down here that shows that the majority of the skill scores are above 0.9. But it's a nice way to easily pick out what are the good models, uh, where are the where are the good climate divisions. <coughs> and then we can do the same for the cold season. Have fun with heat maps. What we pulled out to move forward with is a smaller ensemble of just five top performing during the warm season and five top performing models during the the cold season. So we're not using the entire ensemble of 32 anymore moving forward. We're only looking at the top performing ones, the ones that have high skill based on observations and the ones that pass the, that more stringent significance test. So this is uh, observations of 20 year return period consecutive dry day lengths. Um, we've got the warm season on the left and the cold season on the right. Uh, warm season sort of kind of you know, kind of homogeneous to some extent. Um, somewhere between 40 and 60 day uh, lengths of consecutive dry periods that you can expect once every 20 years. If we go over to the cold season, we see a much more stark geographic pattern here where we've got really, really long consecutive dry periods in the peninsula and, uh, and coastal areas and then much less further inland and further northward. Right, so here you've got a random generation of a lot of different physical uh, precipitation mechanisms going on. Here, not so much. Right? It's all frontal precipitation in the winter time. You have these regular passage of fronts up here. You don't have them further down south. Now this is this is a model of near future, so 2020 through 2059. And this is this is not differences. It's just absolute values to start with. I'm going to get to difference in just a second. But interestingly, it shows similar spatial patterns. So I'm like, yeah, that's great. You know, we've got the same sort of spatial pattern going on. We've got sort of uh, homogeneous in the warm season. We've got this stark contrast between coastal and inland in the in the cold season. And then what I've got here is them separated into RCP four and a half and RCP eight and a half down here. Again, that's the near future. And we can do the same for further in time. This is the end of the century. Again, similar sorts of patterns, but of course what we're really interested in is what the change is going to be in the future. So this is this is the change absolute value of consecutive dry days for the near future period. So not a lot going on in the warm season again is on the left and then the cold season's on the right. So not a whole lot of change in the warm season for about a quarter of the climate divisions there is a slight up to 10 day decrease in the length of consecutive dry days. So those lengths of time between rainfall events are getting a little bit, a little bit shorter, moderately shorter. But what we start to see in the cold season is again this, this stark difference between coastal and inland and more northern locations. And also we begin to see larger 
increases in the length of consecutive dry days. And this is more pronounced in the higher RCP scenario. And then as we move further into the future, it becomes even more pronounced as we go out to the end of the century. We start to see much more in the way of lengthening of consecutive dry days um, for more northern, more inland locations. Now, I think that that is somewhat problematic because summertime, yeah, I mean, we're getting slightly less lengths of consecutive dry days. So, you know, yeah, that might affect agriculture a little bit. But if we look at the, the, the cold season, the winter time, this is when we recharge. This is when we increase our storage. And particularly, we have a lot of surface reservoirs up here. Right? So this is where we're seeing the big reductions in the winter time uh, in terms of potential for recharge and storage. So, kept it really short. This is because we don't have food. I'd like to go and get <laughs> um, So, so you know, um, I think it's nice that the uh, the models seem to be getting spatial patterns uh, down nicely. Um, the models generally perform better in the cold season versus the warm season. The warm season is more chaotic. We've got a lot more stuff going on. You've got convective precipitation. You've got tropical cyclones coming in and messing up everything. Whereas in the winter time, we've got much more kind of uniform precipitation formation processes going on. So that's not necessarily unexpected. Um, we have in about a quarter of the stations decreases in the length of consecutive dry days in the, in the warm season. But we have up to 20 day increases in consecutive dry periods during the winter time, particularly in Alabama, Tennessee, and Mississippi, the places where we need the winter time precipitation for recharge and storage, and also places where we have um, the big hydropower interests. Well, right, so that's particularly uh, worrying. And all of these changes are, are present in whatever RCP or whatever future time period. But when you go to the higher RCP and you go further into the future, the changes become more, uh, more pronounced. And what we've, I mean, what we've tried to do here is uh, do this in such a way that we're, you know, we're looking at two future time periods. We've got a near future. We've got a further out in time, you know, for for um, for, for management for policy decisions here. Um, we've also tried to look at it seasonally, and, and a seasonal definition is dependent on agriculture. Um, again, thinking about impacts. Uh, we've also looked at uh, two different RCP scenarios, so we're presenting that as well. Um, and you know, so we're trying to we're trying to make this as and using 20-year return periods, we're trying to make this as useful uh, as possible. Um, and then I think that you know, just just to, to, to finish, I think that when you if you think about what, what we've seen here, possible 20 day increases in lengths of consecutive dry periods. If you start to think about that in the broader context of, well the South is probably going to be warmer in the future, there's probably going to be greater rates of evapotranspiration in the future, and when you start putting all that together, it starts to paint this picture in your mind that we're probably going to have more frequent, more severe droughts in the future. But if you think about longer periods between precipitation, warmer temperatures in general, more evapotranspiration, it's probably not going to be a good, uh, good scenario. So that is, that is me. Um, that's one of the papers from this, if you want to look it up. And um, thank you, and, and that's my email. longer periods of both dry and warm, how could that be compounded by storms? Or how does like, tropical storms play into that in the future? <laughs> well, uh, you know, tropical cyclones, storms are, are, are always iffy in, in future models. Um, it's, <laughs> it's, it's difficult to resolve those. Um, and, and really, we have, a, I think, a difficult enough time arguing amongst ourselves about whether the, the frequency of, of tropical cyclones has changed historically. And then also, what the heck climate change is going to do to tropical cyclones into the future. Um, there are some people that believe that we're going to see more tropical cyclones, that those tropical cyclones are going to be perhaps higher categories than they've ever been before, um, mostly to do with us having a warmer sea surface temperature and more moisture in the atmosphere. So when a storm does happen, it's going to intensify quicker and perhaps reach a higher you know, in peak intensity um, than we've seen historically. 
Um, and then there are some people that, that argue that that's not the case. So um, it's, it's, I, think, I think the jury is, is still out there. Um, I think that, I think that what, what we're seeing here, and remember these models are performing well in the cold season where we're, you know, we're not going to typically have tropical cyclones. And I think that that, you know, and we're also seeing that that's going to be where we see the biggest um, lengthening of these consecutive dry days. Um, and I think that the models perform better in the cold season generally because we have a more, uh, a sort of less random, less chaotic way of generating precipitation in the cold season. So I, if I had to say I'm confident, you know, more confident about any of these results than others, I would say I'm mostly confident about the cold season. I'm more confident, therefore, about the, the lengthening of, of dry periods in that season as we move forward. I think that what's potentially going on there, if, if we, you know, if we look at the the map again, is that we're generally in the models probably having less of a temperature gradient across this region, and generally that means that we're not going to see the same frontal passage of storms through here in the winter time. They're generally going to come down here, so that's why it's getting drier up here. We're having this less frequent passage of these storm systems, um, just because. You know, for one thing, the Arctic is warming a lot faster than the rest of the northern hemisphere, so the whole temperature gradient across the northern hemisphere is changing. So I rambled on there, yeah, but that was a good question. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you mentioned that you use the, the high resolution data in this downscaling. That's high, high resolution, that's a, what's the data source for that? Huh? That's a, just a real observation or? Yeah, so that, that, that live in the data set. My, my observational data set. Yeah. So it's gritty data set. So it's, I mean, it's, it, so it's gritty and it's model derived. Um, I don't have a reference for it, but that's Ben Libner's website. Um, and it's, it's based on, again, about, about 20 to 30,000 um, uh, co-op stations across the US and into Canada and Mexico. And um, some, I think he uses satellite data, he uses a bunch of different stuff. It's a, a, a sinographic mapping that he does. So for, for, for this uh, modeling, you, you use a basically kind of more quantitative like media compilation? Or, or well, for, for the models itself, these are already run, right? So I didn't, I didn't, I didn't run the downscaling. So this has already been downscaled using localized control. Yeah, but I guess in here this some kind of more like a calibration or coefficient stuff. So what, what, what's the that's the mechanism of process here? Yeah. What's the what sir? Uh, I just said uh, wondering in a Z for the the during the downscaling process, uh, I guess we need to do kind of a calibration for some kind of particular stuff or Yeah, so, so I mean the model structure and how you determine the so the localized, the localized constructed analog, as I went through there, you know, how we, how we actually do it, um, it's, it's calibrated against this, this data set, subset of this data set, prior to me getting it. Yeah. Uh, so I'm here, thank you for your presentation. On your conclusion, slide, the 20 consecutive days, dry days, um, would that be enough for like the utility, a uh, drinking water treatment utility in Alabama to because um, we've always known to have plenty of water, right? It's never been an issue except for that drought, which in 2016 um, affected uh, the surface waters. But if, would that data be enough to show, hey, you need to start looking at alternative sources because um, your surface reservoirs are going to reduce and you're not going to be able to meet the demand. Mm -hmm. um, so w is, would that be a direct application or? Um, I mean, I d you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I know nothing about water management, but um, I hope that it, it's 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 the impetus for for them looking into that. Um, I I don't know what other resources are readily available. Um, obviously there obviously there's a, a lag between these you know it being a long consecutive dry period and the runoff and the recharge and the reservoirs. Um, so really, I mean, I would. I would hope that it's I would hope that it's it's useful in terms of saying well we need to think about these longer periods of potential dry weather in the future and we need to be able to plan for that we need to say well we need to have a backup source that we're going to go to um, and and 
I hope here that you know we're, we're kind of thinking near term and long term that we have enough um, enough of a, a, a lead thing here where they can actually implement something. So this CDD coming in Friday is going to calculate. Is it like the maximum in each year, like the worst case scenario? Yeah, it's the single max. Yeah. So do you think like, I mean, in general, so we have like the consecutive dry, dry days, but this does not necessarily reflect the amount of precipitation, right? right? So as the air is like warming, I mean, global warming and like air in general, when the air is uh, like, let's say warmer, it can handle more, it can have more precipitation or precipitable water vapor. And so maybe in those, let's say short periods, uh, that precipitation falls, uh, you see more precipitation in general, and then like this basically no balance out. <laughs> yeah, I mean most projections in the and south. That's just case. <laughs> yeah, um, most projections in the southeast have us increasing these intense precipitation events. So generally, having more intense precipitation when it does happen, but these longer periods of no rainfall in between, um, you know. <laughs> Maybe, maybe the total amount does balance out there, but you get into an issue of the distribution of when that total amount is being delivered. Um, so I, I think it just makes the whole water management situation more chaotic if you have to think about these longer periods of time where we're not having any input. It requires more thinking and being more careful about planning, I think. Um, I've, uh, I did another study with a student and we found that um, uh, intense precipitation events are increasing throughout much of the southeast, and we expect that that's going to continue. Um, a lot of that probably has to do with more frequent passage of moist tropical air uh, northward, in particular. Um, so, I, you know, I imagine that trend is going to continue if we have warmer air and it's got more moisture in it. Yeah, um, but I think that if we think about just the delivery of of the precipitation, then it, it makes it more. Um, more, you know, it's trickier to plan. Any the fall, uh, the drought, drought measurements, I guess that's the, the people use the many different indicators. You know, yeah. So compare, yeah. you use it, so how many dry days to compare with the, like precipitation or moving moisture right. or even you know, river discharge. So what's the potential, you know, say, issue? this uh, as a, how many days? <laughs> what's the, what's the utility of it? No, no, yeah, I, I, yeah I guess it's, yeah, some advantage of this advantage. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that this is just one part of, of the story of drought, right? I mean, this is just an indicative of meteorological drought, as I said at the okay. beginning. I mean, we're not, we're not combining this here with, with soil moisture or antecedent precipitation or runoff, stream <laughs> flow, or, you know, any of that stuff. And I think that that all has to be part of the story. But I think that this is, this is the source of the moisture, right? This is the input. Um, so I think it's interesting to look at this. And I, like I said at the end here, it's, it's interesting to, to think about, well, it's, it's probably going to be warmer. There's probably going to be more evapotranspiration. Probably you're going to have more extremes of soil moisture. And then when you start thinking that in combination with increases in consecutive dry days, the whole situation starts to get more extreme, more complicated.